next Sunday morning, I think I'm going to try to uh, look at the passage in Jeremiah that Brother Dave's been bringing to us. Uh, Sunday night we'll have a business session next, next week. But tonight I want us to look at Colossians chapter 4, beginning, beginning at verse 2. It says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, we thank you for this letter that Paul wrote and, and the words in it. Lord, help us to devote ourselves to prayer. Uh, Lord, we should always be in prayer, but especially, Lord, in, in difficult times and trying times, Lord, we need to turn to you and, and recognize that you're with us all the time and that you see our need and that you meet our needs as we trust you and place our faith fully in you. Lord, we thank you for Jesus and for what he means to us as our Savior and our Lord. And Father, just keep us near the cross, keep us near communication with you. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, at this point here in Paul's letter to the Colossians, he has arrived at the end of some ethical presentations, and, and now he's moving very quickly to a, a series of very important exhortations. And, and, and there are uh, Christian duties, in other words, which touch the two extremes of life. The, the hidden life of our prayer time and the ministry of sharing in the marketplace that everyone sees. Intercessory prayer was, was very important in Paul's life. He, he believed it was important for every Christian to be involved in intercessory prayer. A survey that was taken uh, during a Christian leaders conference one time showed that out of the 600 pastor, staff, and volunteer church leaders and others that were there, it was discovered that 20% prayed less than 15 minutes a day, 23% less than 30 minutes uh, a day, 40% less than an hour, and 17% prayed daily 60 to 75 minutes. And, and that came from a 15 question survey card. More than likely, if, if we were to take a survey uh, among churches in general, most churches would have some maybe similar results, maybe less results today. Our, our church probably wouldn't be much different than, than others. Uh, therefore, the, this call which Paul issues in this scripture is directed to us uh, because we aren't as prayerful as we ought to be. And, and it's appropriate, I think, that we receive this message as we, as we look forward uh, in, in what God might do with us here at Temple. Uh, look there again at verse 2. It says, be watchful, be alert as you pray. Paul says, devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving. Devotion to prayer is, is more than just establishing a habit. There's this idea of persistence for sure. The, the word devote means be busily engaged in, persist in, or or give constant attention to. Uh, prayer in the believer's life isn't just an option for occasional emergencies. You know, when something something uh, uh, all of a sudden pops up that's an emergency, if, if we're to withstand the constant pressures of a fallen, unfriendly world, an, an attitude of persistence and perseverance in prayer is certainly something we need. But Paul's mention of watchfulness or, or being alert uh, suggests there's a danger to be avoided. And, and certainly there are at least two. Uh, first, Satan causes us to be careless so that we neglect the very practice of prayer. And, and secondly, while we're praying, he, he likes to try and dull our minds and distracts our thoughts and keeps us from having the power uh, that, we, that we need to have. And, and therefore, it's important that we not only have the habit of praying, but also that we pray in this alert way. Keeping awake while praying. Awake to the importance of prayer. Awake to Satan's diversions to, to try to divert you. Uh, and awake to your responsibility to prayer. One pastor described this verse this way. He said, 
The admonition is to cling closely to prayer. Cling closely to prayer like it's something that protects, something that helps, something that we have an attachment to. Like this little child clinging tightly to mom here, but could be clinging tightly to a toy or a blanket. A child clings for security, and, and of course, we do find security in prayer, and therefore, we shouldn't let other things divert us. Our job, our family, our friends, the television, whatever that might cause us to be distracted. We need to be so convicted and committed to the ministry of prayer that we keep this duty just extremely close to our hearts. I, I think our biggest excuse might be something like, well, I just can't find the time. I don't have time. And, and you need to start by looking for every opportunity, the car, the shower, wherever we are. Just pray all the time, as Paul told us. Paul goes on at the end of verse 2, and he mentions about being thankful. Be thankful as you pray. Therefore, Paul therefore calls believers to this thankful prayer. Believers who pray with gratitude for God's blessings will be less likely to be led astray by the lures, the lies of, of the enemy. There are many elements in good prayer. You know, we could just start a big long list, something like adoration, confession, thanksgiving, supplication, submission, fellowship, and of course there are many others. I've, I've had a lot of prayer uh, experiences where we're led through that, you know. Uh, pray prayers of adoration to God. Pray prayers of confession to God. And then prayers of thanksgiving. You, know, you can go through this, this big long list. Uh, but I think thanksgiving really should be very high on everyone's list. Uh, I try to always begin my prayer with some thanks. What am I thankful for today? It could just be, it's a beautiful day, God. Thank you so much for that. That's, that's a good place to start. But, you know, like today, thank, thank God for fathers. Thank God for my father and for the fathers in our church. It doesn't matter uh, how persistent you are, you are when your private prayers become just an endless list of asking for things and omitting thanksgiving and, and other aspects of prayer. You know, it, when, when you're just asking for things, that's a very impoverished prayer life. It, it's, it's just poor. Over and over in this letter to the Colossians, Paul encourages them to, to develop gratitude with thanksgiving. Uh, somebody once said that thankfulness is the feather that wings the arrow of prayer. The feather that wings the arrow of prayer. The psalmist wrote in Psalm 104, Enter his gates, what? With thanksgiving. And his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. So try to start praying by just being thankful to God and praising him for, for who he is and what he's done. Uh, there's a legend told about two angels who were sent down to the earth to gather prayers. One was supposed to fill his basket with the petitions, while the other was to gather prayers of thanksgiving. And sometime, uh, after some time of them performing their duties, both of, of the angels returned to heaven. The, the one just had a basket heaped high and, and running over with these innumerable petitions, these requests for help uh, to, to God. Uh, the, the other returned with a very sad and heavy heart. His basket was just almost empty. Uh, prayers of thanksgiving were rarely heard on earth, even though he'd searched very diligently. Uh, so we need to be very careful that we're thankful. Uh, it's easy to, to neglect uh, thanksgiving, but we, we mustn't let that happen. Uh, you should be thankful for salvation, the privileges of, of salvation, uh, for those who assist you to experience salvation, uh, for the gospel, the good news of Christ, be thankful for that. Be, be thankful uh, for missions efforts and missionaries. Thank God for them. Uh, just all sorts of things. You can think of, of hundreds of things to be thankful for. Uh, whatever that, that you are thankful for, you know, uh, I'm not trying to get you to necessarily make them up, but discover the things that, that you're grateful that God's doing. As Paul said, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. That's Philippians 4, 6. And then in, in verse 3, Paul gives us the petition he would have us lift up to God. Uh, 
essentially, be concerned. Uh, pray for us. Be concerned about what's happening to us and, and pray for us about it. Uh, we must always remember that prayer is one of the laws of the universe, really. Uh, prayer is the law by which God works and moves on our behalf and on behalf of, of the needs of, of really the whole world. Uh, granted, it's a law that is denied by most and ignored by so many others. Uh, even those who understand it to be one of God's laws often neglect it. Uh, nevertheless, God has established this spiritual law that He works in response to our prayers. Why did He do that? I don't really know. But He did it, I think, mostly to get us involved. To help us to see that He wants to do things in the world. He's ready to do things, but He needs to hear our involvement in what's going on. Therefore, if, if we want the blessings of God on our lives, on our ministries, uh, if we want the work of God going forth in power and bearing fruit, then we have to pray for the ministers of the gospel. Pray for our deacons. Pray for our, our Sunday school teachers. Uh, pray for the leaders of, of the different classes and different activities and events that we do. Uh, pray for the leaders of our, of our country uh, in, in our city government, in, in our state govern, government, and our federal government. Uh, we must learn to intercede in prayer. Uh, the Phillips translation of verse 3 here. Include us in your prayers, please, that God may open for us a door for the entrance of the gospel. Pray that we may speak of the mystery of Christ. Think, think about it for, for just a minute here. By our prayers, we can project ourselves literally around the world into every missions effort going on. Uh, every need uh, can become our concern. And we can be right there in, in, our, in our minds as we pray. Paul is, is specific in this verse. He says, first, include us in your prayers, please. Uh, through our daily prayers, we share in all of the circumstances, the duties and joys and sorrows, the reversals, the successes, the total ministry of our missions family. We begin to develop a continual unbroken, although unspoken, presence with them. Paul has said, pray that utterances may be given to me that I may open my mouth to boldly share Christ. Pray for the words that the missionaries speak. Pray for the words that I speak and, and others as they, as they witness. Of course, that's what every missionary wants, that you would pray. You know, God give them the words to say. Secondly, he says, pray that God may open for us a door. There are closed doors in our world today. In many strategic places, doors that our missionaries have long prayed to be open. What would happen if 10 million Southern Baptists began to pray intensely for those causes? What would happen if we would pray that doors would be opened here in this little community? A revolution? You know, a revival? A great awakening? Paul also asks them, thirdly, to pray for the entrance of the gospel. He's, he's trying to get the people of Colossae to link up with God's messengers, God's missionaries, and to join them in their work throughout the world through their prayers. And, and that kind of prayer links them together, you know, in one cause. Uh, it, it's like the military, you know, the clerk back at the base behind enemy lines doesn't really feel a part of the war. He may think he wouldn't be missed, but... Suppose a soldier from the front called him up and told him to be sure to send out that next batch of supplies. You know, he might say, without them, we're not going to make it. You know, we're, we're depending on you to send us these things we're going to need. I, I think that might help him see the significance of his job. And that's what I think Paul's trying to do here. He's, he's linking those on the front line of God's kingdom with those in the obscure places who must be faithful to pray for them and tell them, we're depending on that prayer because without it, we won't have the power. We won't be able to do what we need to do. You know, we need to completely understand that the, the prayer is such a vital part of, of the believer's life, of the, of, of the missionary's life. Uh, God has solemnly chosen to change and do, do certain things through our prayers. He's waiting to do it until we pray. There's another military story that's, that's told about underwater divers who worked during World War II. 
as, as fighting raged above the water, they performed their work under the water. Uh, while at work, their only connection with the world above was the airline that was hooked up to a pump on, on top. And, and while the underwater divers were, were working down below, a man was stationed there next to the pump to make sure that it remained operational. You know, if he left his post, the, the diver would be at risk if that pump quit working uh, to pump air down to his lungs. And, and so God has stationed us like that pump operator. We're, we're in various key places while some others go underwater, so to speak, and, and work it at bringing down the strongholds of the enemy and then these others have been assigned up on top to help and pray. Uh, prayer is the life support system that requires our devotion all, all over the world. Uh, the workers of God are at work, at, at war, uh, working against the powers of darkness and, and prayer warriors. We don't, we don't want to leave our posts and, and, and not keep the air coming to those who need it. And then lastly, Paul says, pray that we may speak of the mystery of Christ. The hope of the world is Jesus Christ. And Paul is quite specific here in his prayer. He, he, he says, therefore, we should pray that way, not just bless, Lord, bless the missionaries. But Lord, open up the way for the missionaries and, so that they can tell the world about Christ, that he died for their sins. In that way, you're able to preach the gospel where it's never been preached and to witness to someone who's never heard Jesus and, and to start a church in a place where there's never been one uh, through your prayers and your gifts uh, to all the ways that we support missions. You know, a lot of Christmas offering that we take up, the Annie Armstrong Easter offering, uh, associational and, and, and state missions offerings, and uh, just giving to our local church, a percentage of that goes to help missions work uh, all around the world. Paul, unquestionably, the greatest preacher and, and teacher that the world has ever known wasn't above requesting the, the prayers of the people of God. Uh, he felt his need of their prayer help because he didn't think that because he was in jail, his work was over. He knew it could continue. And although he was uh, unable because of being in jail to face multitudes in public places as in his past years he was always on the lookout for chances to serve and he wanted the saints to join with him in prayer that even while he's in prison a door for the word would open he said uh, how, <laughs> how natural it would have been for him to say well might as well give up you know <laughs> Might as well not worry about it. It's just settle down in utter despair and discouragement or to endure those long, weary months of imprisonment in a passive way, just simply taking it for granted that he, he'd not been able to spread the gospel again and, and, you know, until he was free. You know, then he'd have an opportunity, but now he was just all locked up. But Paul had another mind entirely to that. His circumstances in his mind didn't indicate that God had forsaken him or that God had set him to one side. He was eagerly looking for fresh opportunities to advance against the enemy. Uh, just before the first battle of the Marne War in World War I, Marshal Ferdinand Falk, uh, the great French general, he reported very, very briefly and very succinctly, my center is giving, my left wing is retreating, the situation is excellent, I am attacking. It wasn't just military arrogance because the marshal realized that apparent defeat could be turned into victory by acting with, with resolution, by going quickly, with speed. At the very moment when the enemy seemed to be triumphant, uh, doubtless the, the devil thought that he gained a, a great advantage when he shut Paul up in prison. But from the prison cell came at least four of the church of letters, the church epistles, and some of the pastoral letters, which have been the means of untold blessing to millions of people throughout the centuries. And the gospel went out from that cell too, first to the prison guards and through them to many more in Caesar's palace uh, who might not have otherwise been reached with the gospel. How important it is not to, to give ground to Satan, but in prayer, in faith, to turn every defeat into victory, 
assured that our great captain knows no retreat and he can you know we can through him seize the opportunity and advance against our enemy uh, we spend too much time I think halting between two opinions debating what we should do and, and then doing nothing we we need the grace of decision that will enable us to seize the opportune moment and take immediate action in the fear of God of course reverence to God so Paul told us here in Colossians 4 5 Conduct yourselves with wisdom toward outsiders, making the most of the opportunity. As we interact with people in the world, we, we need to remember that we may have chances to share the gospel with them and that opportunities once given may never come again. It's tremendously important to take advantage of, of such privileges God gives us a, a service to Him because our, our, our works, God's Word tells us, our works will be reviewed at the judgment seat of Christ. Uh, the late Dr. Cords Redford uh, told a story about when he was a boy in a, in a church in Atlanta. Uh, for years, Dr. Redford was on the staff of the Home Mission Board. Uh, the School of Theology at SBU is named for Dr. Cords Redford. Uh, he told about when he was 11 years old in, in this church. He was at home with his mother and his younger sister. They, they lived there about two miles from the nearest neighbor, and that was through a pine thicket. Uh, his sister became just violently ill. His mother was doing the best for her that she could. It was uh, dark, you know, it was late night, dark night. Knowing I greatly feared the dark, Dr. Redford said, my mother led me to the front step, put her arm around my neck, and said, Courts, I understand your fear. I know it's two miles to a neighbor. I'm not going to say that you must go for help, but I do say what you do about it may well mean the difference between life and death for your sister. Courts ran in fear, in fear for his sister's life, and he got help saved her life we kind of stand in the same place you know our world is desperately ill nobody's saying you have to go you have to pray you have to give so others can go but the truth is what you and i do about it may well mean the difference between success and failure life and death for some heaven or hell we're going to sing a song tonight as we close. All of us need to commit to doing what God's called us to do.